Good morning, Grace Chapel. I'm Ruthie Siders, one of the pastors, and joining me today is Taylor Grafham. She's our director of middle school ministry on the Lexington campus, and we're co-preaching today. When Taylor and I were working on this sermon together, thinking about this topic of disruption, I shared with her how my mind has been going back frequently to this old TV show I used to watch as a kid. It was the Ed Sullivan Show. Not only had she not heard of the Ed Sullivan Show, she hadn't even heard of Ed Sullivan. It was one of those old variety shows, and if you do remember, it was on CBS on Sunday nights, right after 60 Minutes. And the act that I have been going back to over and over was an act by a guy named Eric Bren. He was the guy that used to spin the plates. He would take a plate, start it spinning on a short stick, then transfer it to a taller stick and start spinning it, and then go grab another plate, do the same thing, and do it over and over, and then start running back and forth to keep all of the plates spinning at the same time. Now, I don't know about you, but I have felt like I've had way too many plates spinning during this pandemic. To say that this has been a season of disruption is an understatement. You know, at first it seemed like a gift to be at home, get to get up and get my cup of tea. But as it wore on, we were in nonstop Zoom meetings. The season has gone longer and longer. And this image of the plate spinner has just kept coming back more and more in my mind. Now, Taylor, now that you understand this whole concept of too many plates spinning, can you relate? Oh yeah, I can relate. I've been spinning the plates of online grad school, buying my first condo, dealing with all the paperwork that comes with that, renovating my condo, organizing small groups for middle schoolers, working with the student ministry team on things like the virtual retreat, uh, connecting with students and leaders, staying in touch with my family, staying in touch with my friends, and obviously attending a million and one Zoom meetings. So, you know, all the things. So how do we focus? on what's important when we feel like we're being pulled in so many different directions. This is something that many of us have been thinking about during this season of disruption and so decided that we would make following the way of Jesus our theme for this year. As we began this fall, we began by looking at what we are calling the spiral of discipleship. It's an upward spiral and it begins with some kind of disruption that God can use to soften our hearts and then lead us into a divine encounter. That divine encounter propels us to a decisive moment, which Pastor Brian talked about last week in his call to us to repentance. And if we let it, if we are open to it, that decisive moment can lead us to doing something differently, which would then lead us higher into the spiral to discovering life. Now, one of the things that we can count on is that God will not waste a challenge or a suffering or a disruption. He will redeem it every time for his purpose. Is there something in your life that you would like to see changed? Are you hoping that your life or faith or family or work might be different, redeemed as a result of all of this? It's that opportunity to see, think, and do something differently that Taylor and I are going to address today. We're going to look directly at an encounter with Jesus that spoke directly into the lives of two women, sisters, Martha and Mary, who were trying to manage the many different expectations that were placed on them. But before we enter the story, Taylor's going to give us some background that will help us understand why this brief encounter was such a decisive moment, which led these women to doing things differently as they followed Jesus outside of the box. Located within the ancient Near East culture, the first century world of Jesus's day was steeped with cultural and societal expectations, roles, and boundaries, especially for women. These standards for both men and women dictated the, the extent in which they could participate in a various area of life. One of the most important aspects of life at that time was religion, which contained specific guidelines that stated that only men were able to study religious teachings under the rabbis. 
The faith community was influenced by societal standards of the day that dictated and even restricted the involvement of women. But with Jesus, we witnessed something new, something different. Jesus not only addressed and ministered to men, but also to women. Jesus crossed the boundary that often excluded women from religious life. He taught in a way that included men and aspects of their day, such as the parable of the shepherd or the parable of the friend at midnight. But Jesus' teachings broke the expectation by also intentionally including female characters and using activities of a woman's daily routine to convey his teachings, such as the parable of the persistent widow or the parable of mending a garment. These teachings would have never happened before. Through his words, Jesus addressed women and men, using both as examples to learn from and emulate. And Jesus' radical inclusion is also apparent in those he traveled with. In Luke 8, we see that Jesus not only did ministry alongside his 12 male disciples, but he was also accompanied by women who are specifically recorded by name, Mary Magdalene, Susanna, Joanna, and many others. And these women, they weren't just along for the ride, but they actively supported the ministry and contributed to it by supporting the 12 disciples and Jesus out of their own means. And so this morning we pick up our story in Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. It says this, as Jesus and his 12 disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So friends, picture the scene. Martha is embracing her duty as the ideal host, so excited that Jesus has agreed to stay long enough even for a meal. So Martha goes to work furiously putting together a big meal for such a special guest. In my mind, I hear the voice of the character Golda from Fiddler on the Roof. The rabbi is coming and he's staying for dinner. What a blessing and he'll probably have the 12 with him, even more blessings. <laughs> Jesus enters the house and at some point begins teaching. I imagine both Mary and Martha loved his stories because what's great about his stories is exactly what Taylor just said. They're not all about the men. He teaches about women too, but not only does he talk about women in his teaching, he speaks to women directly even when he's out in the community or the marketplace. Now I'm sure they've also heard stories around town of some of the amazing things that Jesus had done, things that they'd only heard about in the prophets. He heals people, but not exactly who you might expect. He cures a Samaritan who was stricken with leprosy. A beggar in the middle of town receives his sight. And a woman stricken with a bleeding condition is healed right in the middle of a huge crowd of people. In these moments, Jesus is modeling for us to not feel confined to preset expectations. There's no limit to ways people can encounter God and God's grace. And this is a lesson Martha is about to learn for herself. But let's see where Mary is at this point. So where is Mary? Let's return to the text with verse 39. Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Mary knew she should probably be in the kitchen with her sister, but Jesus had so much to say and she felt compelled to sit and listen and take it all in. After all, Jesus was no ordinary rabbi. He was not bound by the strict cultural codes of conduct. Instead, Jesus treated women just as significant as the men. They weren't second class, but they were welcomed into his inner circle of teachings. And so while I doubt that Mary didn't want to help, it was just that she couldn't tear herself away from this teacher who welcomed her to sit at his feet. In the ancient world, to sit at the feet of a rabbi was a defining characteristic of a disciple, someone who would learn these teachings from the rabbi so that they can share them with others. If Jesus had been in your home, where would you have rather been? Now, imagine how Martha must have felt. Listen to how the story continues with verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. 
the word translated distracted here meant that she was being pulled in all sorts of different directions. Ken Bailey in his book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes writes this. Martha, we're told, is distracted, not burdened with much serving. To be distracted, one must be distracted from something by something. Clearly, Martha is distracted from the teachings of Jesus by her cooking. Remembering the cultural expectations we talked about earlier, Bailey continues by saying, in our Middle Eastern context, Martha is more naturally understood to be upset over the fact that her little sister is seated with the men and has become a disciple of Rabbi Jesus. It's not difficult to imagine what's going on in Martha's mind. Martha approaches the situation from her point of view, her standard of how her life and her sister's life should look like. And knowing those cultural and personal expectations of how things ought to go and how she should act has pulled her attention as she works hard to prepare the meal for her guests. Not only does Martha's and society's vision draw her away from the presence of Jesus, she goes even further to criticize her sister for acting outside of that vision of how a woman should act when such guests are visiting. Instead of helping, her sister has assumed the role of a man sitting and listening to Jesus. How have cultural norms or other people's expectations impacted or shaped your life? Have you ever felt boxed in by them, even spiritually? An encounter with Jesus often offers us an alternative vision for one's life that goes beyond our personal expectations or society standards. For Martha, whose life vision and expectations revolve around being the ideal woman according to society norms, Jesus' alternative kingdom vision crosses that boundaries and disrupts her expectations to include both men and women in what God is doing. In striving to serve Jesus, Martha is not focused on Jesus, but rather she's focused on the tension of being pulled in so many different directions. Being a sister, being a host, being a woman, wanting to please Jesus, wanting to know Jesus. Have you ever felt that way? What are the different things in your life pulling you in different directions? Are they different now that we're seven months into this quarantine, hybrid work, school, church life? What standards or expectations are you trying to live up to? And it's in this tension that we find Martha determined to live up to the expectations placed upon her and furious that Mary is not. She can't believe Mary's been in there ever since Jesus arrived. It's one thing to welcome him into the house, to take him someplace to sit, even perhaps to offer to wash his feet, to give him a drink of water, but to sit down Sit there just like a man? Who does she think she is? A disciple? It's the duty of the women to provide the meal. It was not appropriate for Mary to ignore the work and the needs that need to be done just so she can sit and listen to Jesus teach. Taylor's right. Martha feels pulled in half. She too wants to sit and listen to Jesus teach, but she has obligations. Martha is the responsible one. Martha is the rule follower. This is her tradition, and it's how women have always managed their homes. Jesus must understand that Mar Mary has gone one step too far. So she goes in to ask him, or rather, to tell him. Can't you just see her? I picture her standing in the doorway. Her hands are on her hips. She has flour on her apron. Her hair is a little tussled. And Mary is still seated quietly at the feet of Jesus. And Martha just blurts out, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. I imagine Mary immediately feels beet red, lowers her eyes, maybe cowering a bit. She wonders, was she wrong to stay and listen to the master? She starts to stand up, but I imagine Jesus' hand reaches out and just gently touches her shoulder as if to say, it's okay, just stay right where you are. Martha is incredulous. Are you kidding me? This is indeed a very unusual rabbi. But then is there a hint of a grin creeping over Jesus' face as he looks Martha in the eye, and even though she knows she's right, 
Why does she suddenly feel like maybe she's the one who got it all wrong? She was not yet prepared for how Jesus would respond. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Imagine that. Mary, who's clearly in the wrong here, according to all of their traditions and protocols, is not only allowed to stay to listen, but is actually told that that's the better choice. Jesus' words here echo his response when asked about the greatest commandment a little earlier in the passage. Mary has chosen to love God with all her heart, mind, soul, and strength above all the other things that are trying to claim her attention. Mary is first and foremost fixing her identity as a disciple of Jesus and then allowing all the other areas of her life to flow from there. And this decision that's affirmed by Jesus, it's not just for Mary, but it's for all who have been excluded. For when they hear Jesus speaking and teaching, he's speaking to them too. This is a decisive moment that puts both of these women on a trajectory of doing things differently. How is this season been a decisive moment for you? How have you had to do things differently? Has Jesus gotten your attention in this time to reset some of your priorities? We as a church community have been adjusting together in this season as we do things differently when it comes to our faith community. Parents of young children, are, during this time, our partnership with you has become more important than ever. We're making almost 400 Kids Town at Home kits for you to use weekly with our weekly videos and our monthly FX gatherings. In this decisive season, we're all doing things differently to help our children discover Jesus and his love for them. Middle school and high school students and parents, we had over 150 of you participate in our first ever virtual retreat, making it a huge success. As a student ministry team, we're learning how to continue to not just maintain, but to continually grow a highly relational ministry, even when we can't be together in person. What have you done differently this season? Have you noticed that watching sports has taken up less of your time, giving you more time to read, start a new hobby, or just spend time with family or friends? Have you saved more money by cooking at home than you did before? Have you started a new spiritual habit that's brought you closer to God? Now, we also realize that this has been an extremely difficult season for many. We continue to hear that issues of anxiety and depression are on the rise among people of all ages, young people and college students, parents and singles, and even older adults. Tensions in the home rose during those months of not being able to go anywhere. We know some of you have faced job loss or furlough, and you're not even sure how you're going to pay your bills next month. Others have loved ones in care facilities or in the hospital, and you haven't been able to visit in person. And some of you are still waiting to celebrate the life of someone dear to you who God called home during this season. Perhaps you feel that the distance between you and Jesus has actually grown during this season. Well, Martha knew some of those feelings of disappointment and confusion and even distance from Jesus. The disciple John tells us that several years later, just a short time before Jesus was to make his final journey into Jerusalem, Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus became very ill. They sent word to Jesus through a messenger, and they assumed Jesus would come quickly as soon as he got word that his friend was sick. But three days passed since they sent the message. Three days passed since they buried their brother. And it wasn't until the fourth day that Martha gets word that Jesus is drawing near. So she runs out to meet him right out there on the road and begins to speak with him. And her first words were, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know God will give you whatever you ask of him. So Jesus asks Martha if she believes all that he has said to her about him being the resurrection and the life. 
And at this very moment, she speaks one of the most profound statements affirming who Jesus is that's recorded in scripture. It's clear that the years that followed that first encounter over lunch, Martha has become a follower of Jesus and placed his kingdom vision as the first priority in her life, even while she's remained attentive to the traditions of her people. Martha looks Jesus in the eye and boldly proclaims, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Martha said that. Sure, on that first visit, she was preoccupied with the baking of bread and making the house ready. She was angry and frustrated with Mary for not helping and instead sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him teach. But that encounter was a defining, decisive moment. So over the next few years, there would be more visits with Jesus, more opportunities to learn from him. And with each occasion, she grew more aware that he was so much different than any other rabbi. More than that, Martha has come to the realization that Jesus is the Messiah her people were waiting for and of whom the prophets had spoken. Jesus truly is the Son of God. We witness Martha following Jesus outside of the box. She leaves her guests behind at her home and runs out to the road to meet Jesus. Her bold actions reveal how far she's come in her understanding of who Jesus is and her commitment to become one of his disciples. Even in this moment, when Martha's confused and feeling pulled in so many directions, she encounters Jesus in another decisive moment. And Mary had a similar reaction to Jesus' arrival. She too said that if Jesus had only been there, then her brother would not have died. But that's all she could say. She dropped to his feet weeping. And the depth of her emotion combined with Jesus' own loss, the sting of death of someone he truly had loved, brings Jesus to tears. Mary and Martha stood by as Jesus looked to heaven and then calls Lazarus out of the grave. And he was raised back to life and given back to his sisters. These two women from that first meal have had the unique privilege of an intimate relationship with Jesus. Jesus honored each of the women for the unique gifts and personalities they brought. And Jesus knew what each of them was trying to balance and manage. And yet, in the midst of that, he challenges them not to just believe in and interact with God in a way that was mediated by their personal expectations or society standards. Rather, Jesus called them to approach faith differently, to envision themselves differently, and to do something differently that revealed that Jesus and his kingdom are the primary lens through which they viewed their lives, instead of seeing Jesus and faith as just another additional task to manage. And Jesus continues to invite each one of us wherever we are right now. When we feel like we're too busy with too many plates spinning, Jesus encourages us to stop. Put the plates down for a moment. Sit and enjoy being in Jesus's presence. And when we feel like we've lost hope, Jesus challenges us to stretch our faith, to stand on what we believe, trusting him with our questions, our doubts, our fears, and our anxieties. Earlier, Taylor mentioned that we don't want to continue to maintain, but rather grow our student ministry. We want our students in this season of disruption to put down deep the roots of their faith in rich soil. We want them to grow up in maturity and understanding. We want them to grow inward in their trust and love for Jesus. And we want them to grow outward in their influence in the world and among their friends by being the hands and feet of Jesus. And frankly, we don't just want that for our students. We want that for all of us as well. In this season of disruption, we are all choosing to follow Jesus outside of the box. Why? because the box we have put him in is too small. There is so much 
that Jesus wants to do in and through us that cannot possibly be contained in a box. He wants to do things differently through each and every one of us. So how will you respond to Jesus this week? Will you come close and sit at his feet? Get to know and love him more deeply. Or will you take a stand and speak up about who you believe he is? What will you do differently in response to this decisive moment or season in which you find yourself as a parent or a spouse, a son or daughter, a friend, or as a disciple? Taylor is going to give us an idea for a possible next step. In the midst of all the plates we're spinning and responsibilities we're trying to manage, it can be hard to find the time to even figure out what can I do differently to see my life through the lens of Jesus. So I'd love to offer you a tool to help you in this, something you can do right now differently in your daily routine to help you recenter life around what Jesus is doing in your life. It's called the Prayer of Examine. The Prayer of Examine is a reflective prayer that helps us discover the movement of God in our lives by asking and praying through a series of questions and prompts. It can be done at the end of a day as you look back on it, or it can be done on a Saturday morning, looking back on your entire week. I'd love to invite you to participate in this ancient practice with me this morning. So wherever you are, I just ask you to get comfortable, maybe put both feet firmly on the ground. You can also put your hands up like this with your palms up on your lap as a posture of being open to Jesus. And as I offer these prompts, I just encourage you to pray through them and think, take notice of what God is bringing up for you emotionally, physically, relationally. I'll be praying in the first person using I and me, so that's easy for you to enter this prayer and pray alongside me. So I invite you to close your eyes if you'd like, and then take three deep breaths and settle yourself. Let's pray. God, as I enter into prayer, I ask for your light and the understanding of your presence. As I bring the past 24 hours before you in prayer, with gratitude, I review the day in my mind, replaying it almost like a movie. God, I ask you to reveal all the gifts you have given me over the past day, from the big ones to the small ones. I thank you, God, for each of these gifts. As I continue thanking God for the gifts I found in my day, I take a moment to notice when I felt that I had the deepest sense of connection with God, others, and myself. I recognize the emotion present in these moments. I reflect on the moments where I felt the least sense of connection. And I recognize the feelings as well. With 
with these things on my mind, I direct my mind to the next day, asking God to show me how he desires me to respond or what he wants me to do the next day. Is there anything I can do differently? As I move to the end of this prayer, I take a moment to say anything else I wish to say to the Lord. After I've spoken with the Lord, I take three deep breaths and return to this worship service. 